day. It's very wonderful for, to be here, even though I can't see anything, actually. <laughs> but um, this is my first time at Disobey, and I, came, like, I was wondering, can I actually come here? Because I, I like to build things and not break things. But then I thought that actually teaching people, that's about breaking them and then putting them back together. So in, in some ways, I actually belong here. So I have an academic background. Uh, I worked in the University of Helsinki. I got a PhD. And then I sort of decided that I need to do something practical. I went to secure critical infrastructure. Now I work in Ericsson to do that, communications infrastructure, to be more specific. And now I'm a senior specialist. It still hasn't gotten old. I've been senior specialist now for one month, and I think it's awesome. But the process took its toll. None of my grandparents actually survived. And this is uh, joint work with Tero Hannula, whose master's thesis I super supervise. He's a colleague of mine. So since I'm a teacher, I like to tell people what I'm going to talk about first. And um, this, is, uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit since you're not actually all... No, actually, I, I'm, I'm completely confident you're all crypto enthusiasts because crypto is awesome and everyone loves crypto. So why wouldn't you all love it as well? So I'm going to talk a little bit about like what, what actually we do use crypto for. And then I have this fluffy um, human close uh, approach to security. So we're talking about making systems, how it's hard, how we can make everything harder with crypto. And then how can we kind of try to secure things when we put crypto into stuff and then we put it in the wild somewhere into the real world. <sighs> and then I'm going to present some conclusions. And I'm going to try to talk slowly, since I've clocked this for about 40 minutes, and I'm going to say, speak it in about 20 if I'm excited enough. <clears throat> so, what is crypto good for? Like, what do we generally want to use it for? And like, people who are crypto nerds like me, they like to talk about crypto as it's very, very complicated. But it's not really complicated. It's, uh, it's, we use it for integrity stuff, like I put this data here. I want to see if it has changed. If I sign it, for example, I can see that it's, it's changed. Uh, we can use it for confidentiality. So if I want to, for example, send my letters in a sealed envelope instead of as postcards, or I want to lock my door and close my curtains instead of having all my windows open, then that's that kind of thing we use crypto for. And as a side effect of uh, um, other, uh, like, other effects of crypto, we can have identities, which are basically that um, John's passport is officially signed by Suomi Finland AB. They vouch that this passport actually represents who John is. Uh, in, if, if I go into the, a bit more detailed ex examples, uh, when we're using digital signatures, we're actually saying that, hey, oh, I'm this large number. And you can kind of prove that this me message came from this large number because of a, someone, someone else who isn't this large number uh, would have trouble uh, producing that little digest in the end, so the signature. And that is uh, actually what the digital signature is saying. And then we need an identity system um, or a certification system to actually say that the large number translates to Sini, who has a sort of a real world identity. But generally, when you're signing things, you are a large number and you get used to that. Um, for software signing, uh, we would like to know that software hasn't changed and who has actually made it. We can get some idea of who, where it came from before we run it. So we can kind of figure out what kind of stuff we're running before we're running it. Um, and in, for example, in case of TLS connections, uh, we're able to talk to someone without some, uh, someone else eavesdropping. So these kinds of things we kind of understand that, yeah, yeah, of course, this is what we use crypto for. But do we really understand what they make? For example, attestation, remote attestation. I can see lots of crypto. And uh, no, sorry, not crypto people, actually. Security people get really excited about remote attestation. It does awesome things. We know that this host is secure and stuff. But it actually what it says, it says, I booted today with this software, that version. I don't have any idea necessarily what happened after I booted, but that's what happened when I started up. That, but that might be what we are able to attest. And we shouldn't think that it attests something else. Hardware identities are one more identity type which basically could tie, the, for example, a serial number to a cert certain vendor to the certain device that is able to uh, es um, essentially prove that it's that specific large number. And also private blobs, uh, private data can be put into protected blobs. So what it translates to is crypto is used for transferring human trust, 
through time and space. Time in the sense of, for example, did my ch data change? Space in the sense of, for example, uh, num person A can trust person B because they both trust person C, who has signed something, for example. And what it's doing it with is various kinds of hard-to-solve puzzles and using small magic data, which is the keys. And as a special case, there's a public-private key pairs are best for sharing, uh, because if we have shared secrets, then we have to go use sneaker networks and touch all the locks, as was said in the previous presentation. What Ericsson does um, briefly on this um, different kinds of crypto, we're operating in the telco industry, and there's tons of people. They will need some kind of identities for their subscriptions. Uh, there's, uh, there's lots of regulation. There's also systems that need identities. And basically, there's all kinds of applications that will need, for example, public key infrastructure. So we are providing to our customers who are businesses some kind of public key infrastructure services, uh, which can then help them use all the other systems more securely. And uh, it's com it's, um, if you've ever tried to run a public key infrastructure, it sucks. And um, sometimes it's just sort of easier to have some people who can help you do it if you are not kind of buying the system just so that you can run a PKI. Even though running a PKI is awesome fun and a horrible mess, then you might still kind of want to just actually make, be able to make phone calls instead, and then you're not so like, keen on doing that yourself. So that's basically what we do. Of course, since we are also an enterprise, we use PKI in all kinds of internal use, and I won't go into detail on that. Um, but yeah, we have, we have a PKI uh, products and stuff, and oh yeah, I didn't say that what I'm involved with. I'm in, involved with product security for the most part. So, what I'm going to talk about is there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. Like We want to put crypto everywhere now. We've learned that security is very important, so we want to use crypto everywhere. So now we are going to have this uh, new scenario coming up all the time that works excellent in PowerPoint, that you think up a system which has some fun crypto, you then go and deploy that system into the wild, and then you profit. What could go wrong? Yeah. A few things. So, um, like this, this is this is the map of where where we are in uh, in the real world security. We are usually on top of a pole, which is very long, and it's in the middle of nowhere, and it's a bit troublesome to like in the case of hotel locks that were mentioned previously. It's a little bit hard to kind of go there and program it by touching it with a thingy. So what, what do you do when uh, you have real-world considerations like you need to take care of software security and update handling, you need to take care of hardware security, you need to take care of physical security, can someone else go climb in that pole? Actually, some of the base stations are a bit lower down, so they might be able to actually go poke at them. You need to think about configuration, such as uh, what networks are you connecting to, like are you on the internet both and on the radio network? Uh, what kind of users do you allow in the system? And what kind of environment does the system run in? You need to think about cryptography and protocols. Uh, interoperability with other systems. Uh, you need to, well, now these days, especially, we need to think about supply chain security all the way from like where does the little, uh, if you're using open source software, if you're using hardware components from somewhere else, where do they come from and are they secure? And how do you combine them when they're reaching your customers in the end? We need to consider all kinds of human factors, which are lots of fun and chaotic. And we need to um, consider what kind of security capabilities and situational awareness do we have, because it's not a question of do we get hacked. It's a question of can we actually notice. So I would like to complain a little bit first, because life is horribly stressful when you're trying to build things. And like all these lovely people who are trying to break things, um, first you have like from the crypto, crypto point of view, like if you want to uh, summarize it into a single problem, it's like your crypto is broken and your keys are leaking all the time. You need to worry about whether your crypto is agile. Can you actually renew your keys, for example, when they're lost? Then you run it on super hardware. Like it's awesome. It's really secure, except that someone pro like just actually pointed out that they broke it last year. And you installed it on top of a pole. So you're not going to go change that very easily. So then you might have 
a test system, a patching system that can patch instantly, like immediately when a patch comes out, you know, boom, it's in your production systems. And then you find out that your software supply chain is hacked, and you actually just installed a backdoor in all of your systems. You might also run into this problem that occasionally there's a bad engineer. Like, you make a perfect system, but the bad engineer misconfigures it in a way that you didn't intend, and that's why it's broken. It's not, not that the design had any flaws, but it's like, ah, it's the users. We, we don't like the users at all. We love the users. <laughs> then on the other side, uh, you want to need, need to worry about this, um, whether it's actually interoperable. Like um, Silke said in her talk, uh, we, we still have 2G around, so we can't just sort of throw away these kinds of things. You still need to be able to talk to the old boxes, unless you're in the like, very, very comfortable position where you can just say, like, to everyone in your, who are your customers and have integrated your system into theirs, I'm upgrading to version 10 and try to stop me, and we're going to make system, system version 9 not work with anything anymore. So legacy and change management is actually one of the source, sources of security problems. Also, you might have like a very optimized system once it becomes, starts to mature, and then you know that it only has well no vulnerabilities left. That anyone, uh, like that, that uh, where exploit development has also sort of ca caught up with it. You might also find out that your per perfect system is uh, it's advertised as very, very easy to use securely, and you find out that the uh, ease of use actually is only easy for Joe, who is the original senior engineer who built, built it. Yes, <clears throat> and then the last, like security awareness. Can you actually tell if your system got hacked? Like your perfect system, it's inevitably going to get hacked in some way, and you want to know whose botnet are you in at that point. But hey, I'm a crypto nerd, so I come and sort of march in as like, my crypto solves problems, it doesn't create any problems. Except that crypto has the exact same. Yeah, so crypto-wise, crypto uh, we have slightly different problems, but we also have all the other problems. But in crypto terms, uh, you will have uh, randomness that uh, you're going to need to have. Randomness that's not predictable, it's always predictable. Someone's going to tell you that, yeah, yeah, you, you pass the oldest tests barely, but your, the newer tests detect that you are completely not random, actually. And then your keys can be predicted, and then they don't have so many bits of coolness anymore. You can run your crypto on super accelerators, and it's still going to be incredibly slow, especially with uh, post-quantum algorithms. Uh, you're going to have... Side channels are everywhere. You're going to leaking your um, leaking your keys through Spectre and meltdown so through sound, through power usage, through random radiation, and also like if you're having bad thoughts, that's like all everything is going to take away your keys, like and that's where the core of your security is. Then of course, once you've designed an awesome crypto crypto system or a library or something, then some bad developer misimplements it. Like we didn't mean to that. We mean, didn't mean to use it to use that way, but um, we never run into this problem, fortunately, in, in any kind of imperfect systems. <laughs> so, also with crypto and with uh, all other systems, we have the problem of interoperability, and when you get a new crypto algorithm, it's not going to work with anything. Like, I, I can, like, I seriously, I run into uh, products that say that we support everything as long as it came from the 70s, when RSA was set up. You're going to find out that your algorithms are broken. You're going to design your system around them, and the algorithms get broken. Now you find out that you have, you have like a patched padding or ver hash version 6.6c, and you're like, uh, I thought that version 5 was OK. Your keys are always going to be too short, so they're like, they can be broken. Like It takes only 128 years to do that 32-bit key with the one-second testing. So they're always too short. Post-quantum, yeah, we're going to say that like quantum computers might break everything. I'm still kind of, yeah, that's a separate pres presentation. And then in the end, uh, when you find out that your crypto is broken or your keys leaked or something, then you can't go and change them because if you can change them over the air, then everything is lost anyway because someone's going to just change them over the air to their keys. In the end, you're going to trust a single giant turtle. Now, something that we, we've been talking a little bit about uh, crypto, that we need crypto everywhere, but it's actually very important to remember that when you're putting crypto in the product, 
you're not solving a problem, you're transforming your trust problem into a key management problem and some other problems. And you can just hope that the problems that you're transforming your, problem, uh, your original problem into are solvable. That might or might not be the case. So some things to consider. Your system is at most as secure as its private keys. If you have implementation flow or something, then it's less secure, of course. But if your private keys, if you don't know where they are, where they have been, who used them and when, then it's kind of questionable trust in, in the end. It's, it's not that your large number, once you've generated it, you can sort of forget about it. You also need to know where that large number goes after that. Do you store it on your laptop? Where do you keep your laptop? Your system integrity will depend on the trust anchors. In public key infrastructures, if you burn a uh, public key somewhere, then your system integrity is going to depend on whatever kind of, all, the entire chain sits on that burnt trusted, trusted uh, public key. And how do you change when you have, a, for example, an expired key or a compromised root key in the field? How do you go and change it? Can you actually do it over the air? And who else can change your key over the air after that? Most notably, your system is at most as available as its private keys. If you remember the examples I gave in the start, crypto is not a solution to availability problems. It's actually creating availability problems. Try to connect to a trusted party with an expired authentication, authentication key, or try to so up, update signed software that you don't have a private key to sign it with anymore, or your private key expired. So these kinds of problems you need to be aware of when you put crypto anywhere. And you want to put crypto anywhere, so you're going to have to get to love that key management. So we conclude in, in, at this point that we are going to need something to secure systems, and um, so there's a like, somewhat large problem space there. Uh, and uh, since this was a, uh, this is based on a master's thesis, we only had the space for a master's thesis. So we start with something that is the most essential for us. We need to be able to talk so we can talk about what you, tools we use. Structured talking. So this is the second part. Uh, so I want to be able to actually empower the teams that do the work and not just look cool in marketing material. And that is going to create some limitations on what, what kind of things we can apply. The first thing that, uh, that we need to do to get communication working is to be able to speak a language that actually works for the people who use it. So when we look at standardization or certification or kind of these mega corporate practices, then often the co target, uh, target audience for those is manager users, as in managers, or external actors such as auditors. And they're written in that level. So they might not be so like, interesting to the people who are doing this. Like, you have the model of this. You have a wise planning head. The managers, in their wisdom, will write, write documents. And then you have these dumb limbs, like your developers and your administrators and stuff. And they're just implementing the policy. And the process is usually slow, because you have this planning head thinking. And then they try to uh, deploy this uh, policy or whatever practice change to all their, or their employees or otherwise staff. Though the benefit is that you can, the manager can always ask the help for some rare specialist, like they can hire a consultant. Let's make our security documentation awesome. So it's going to say, we never do anything wrong. Here it is. It says that. So now we are certified. But it might not actually, like in some cases, it doesn't actually serve the purpose of securing the system. It mostly serves the purpose of advertising that you're secure because you've written cool documentation. But in my case, I want to do things that I secure systems so that they're actually more secure and not just sort of look cool. I don't actually really need to care about looking cool, fortunately. And I've noticed a lot, in, a lot of times that when you have like cool documentation that says that I'm never going to do anything wrong or we are never going to do anything wrong, the world doesn't actually fit the documentation. It's very like you, you write the document many times even, you can even update it into a next version, and still you have this group of engineers here, here to, like doing all kinds of things that are not in the document at all. And they're getting their job done, and that's very rude. They're supposed to be following the document. But then uh, if you consider, for example, a situation we have this planning head and dumb limbs. If you slip on an ice, then you don't do it 
by sort of first having a little workshop to plan what to do about this falling on your ass in, in like in a few milliseconds and then execute it with your dumb limbs you actually would rather have some kind of dancing moves that you would able to be able to kind of react a little bit more smoothly so when in when we are in an agile world and we need security in that world then in agile terms you need to um, uh, well, I, I use Agile in a very, very flexible way. But in, in these teams that are actually doing the work, you need to be able to speak a language that they can use. So if you have a document that says, we are never doing anything wrong, the team actually needs a document that says, how the hell are we going to be achieving this and that, that we actually need to do? So how do we enable them to do what they need to do? And the communication-wise, um, the way my personality works, I like structured things because it means that there's less chaos. I can prepare more. And I've noticed that the human brain has actually very, very limited capacity. So when you make things predictable and a little bit maybe abstract them and make them sort of fit into nice boxes, then you can think about one box at a time that you can basically fit into your head. And then you can think about another box that you can fit into your head. So we try to split, it up, split these things up into three things. There's your system. There's your human work, and there's the environment, all the other things. So the system, by definition now, is all the non-human parts that you can control. Your system is something that you want to implement and test and maintain in a way that is comprehensible. You want to, want it, want to make it easy for people to interact with your system. For example, you need to make the arch architecture clear, you need to make the documentation useful enough that people can actually use it, or make it self-documenting, I don't care how you do it, but you need to make it comprehensible. Human work, limited brain, brain function, and also your operating staff are always going to be overloaded. Whenever the shit hits the fan, it's going to do it at 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning, and that's not when you want to start reading a 500-page manual to figure out how to fix the system. So you want to cut down on cognitive load. You're going to also cut down on uh, mistakes that way. Wherever you can, you want to plan ahead and you want to eliminate any need for superhuman feats. If there's anyone here from, uh, who has been piloting or performing surgeries, there's all kinds of uh, checklists that are sort of re remove the need to think. And then you can spare that thought instead on the thing that you need to fix. And for example, in our system, systems uh, case, we might want to, for example, have correct and relevant alarms or error messages would be nice. Um, and the environment is actually one thing that is overlooked very much in all the kind of uh, documentation that we looked at on, and the different kind of systems. Environment is everything that's not under your control. And it's actually a very relevant part of your system. So for example, if you're a little team in a little office, you might not be able to say that, hey, I would like to have a power extinguisher in this room. Uh, it might not be in your control. Then you want to be aware that you don't have, a, uh, have, a, have an extinguisher. Uh, but like these kinds of things are, or it might be in, under your control, and in that, in that case, it's part, part of your system. But you want to understand where the border between what things you can control and things you can't control go, and what is your threat model for the environment that you cannot control, and prepare for that. For example, you might want to analyze risks, direct your prioritization. There's a risk analysis uh, um, <laughs> presentation also been in this, dis uh, in this event. And risk analysis is actually something that if you don't do anything else, think risk awarely, and that is going to so like eventually give you the tools to solve many kinds of problems, because if you don't know you have a problem, it's very hard to solve it. As a bonus item, I actually have um, like, Elevator pitches. I think I have an obsession about getting more human resources into security. That's also why I'm talking here, even though crypto people never talk in public. <laughs> and uh, I want to sort of advertise that we need to get more human people, like figure out also ways to get more people into security. Because we are putting all kinds of things online, they're getting connected, and lots of things are at stake. Okay, so uh, this is like a nice, nice, fluffy, ha waving, waving my hands model. So I'm going to put some examples uh, so that you can get some idea of like, what am I trying to explain? And what, what do you kind of, what kind of structure am I trying to, try to put in here? So I have three examples cases, uh, controlling risks of our public key infrastructure deployment, as in putting crypto somewhere. Uh, how, how do we handle a security incident, for example? 
and evaluating like a technical tool set or any other tool set for coverage in terms of addressing these different kinds of threat, threat scenarios. And the aim of the framework all the time is to provide some shared language and structure for discussion and planning so you can have an idea of what kind of things do you have covered and what kind of things don't you have covered. So PKI de deployments, it's a little bit like taking in a baby alien because uh, it, you, you, it kind of looks cute when you start with it, but then it grows and it turns into something weird and it might be life-threatening at that point. And lots of... Um, because it's very, very complicated. It might be very, very tempting to go and sort of ask a nice consultant that, hey, could you do this PKI thing for me? Can I buy this, buy this from you? And then you kind of go away, and then I'm going to live with it. So from a structured system point of view, do you actually know what your little PKI monster that you got has eaten and what its keys can do? Like if the keys get lost, what kind of things break down? Or if the keys leak, what kind of other things break down at that point? From a structured work point of view, does your team have a clear plan on how to renew the keys or do an emer emergency revocation if the keys leak 10 years from now, anyone? You might have a few organizational changes by then. You might not be working here. But when you're sort of securing critical infrastructure, hopefully you will a bit, a bit more sort of worry about these kind of things as well and not just say that, hey, I'm a startup. I don't need to worry about where I am in 10 years from now. I'm going to be rich. Structured environment side. Um, the main thing is understanding the adversarial model, like who would want your keys and why. Uh, and then the sort of things falling apart uh, spontaneously model, such as bus factors. Your, uh, there's one person in your team who understands your crypto and then he gets hit by a bus. What happens to your project then or your product that you put on top of a pole in the middle of nowhere? A second example of security incident handling. So from a structured system point of view, you're going to have some kind of security incident. I, I can sort of tell you, it's a spoiler. Uh, how do you, when you're in a hurry and you're under lots of stress, how do you shake the relevant information out of your system? And is it actually easy? And does it support the kind of cases you might run into? And is there precautions in place that you might sort of consider also that in, in this case for security incidents? Uh, from a structured point, uh, work point of view, uh, do you know does everyone know who needs to be contacted at 4 a.m. on Sunday when shit hits the fan? And who do, who, do, who do they kind of pull in to try to clean up the mess? And also another one is when, if you go into an emergency state, when do you declare that it has passed? When are you done with your emergency cleanup? Structured environment point of view, uh, you think about likely attacks, these kinds of things might happen, or other kinds of security fa failures or other kinds of failures. And then you can kind of help, this can help you mitigate the risks that you identify as most serious. Put your effort there instead of complaining that, hey, I need like extra, extra budget. I don't have enough budget. Therefore, everything is bad. You need to like, now you have this much budget. What do you do with it? And then you go complain about needing more budget. Damn it. So then uh, third example, evaluation of organizational tools. Uh, I, we took a, like random examples for this. Uh, the sys controls are very nice. It's a great tool, like known tool set for hardening and the defense and all kinds of things. Uh, it's uh, technical. It focuses on system configuration. It has a little bit of software security in it and a little bit of human work related things in it. But the caveat here uh, from a team like Stream trying to secure a critical infrastructure uh, system, uh, it does, doesn't pay much attention to the environment. It's not like it's not geared for that. And it has a very thin coverage on structuring work in any way. And some uh, cases that we de detected that like physical and hardware security, interoperability, supply chain security, and human factors, they are not getting much love in this. But once you do that analysis, now you can actually discuss the other tools that you use to fill in the remaining gaps. Just in case you were, weren't thinking that, that, hey, I'm going to just go to this Gartner uh, company and ask them to se sell me some security for 500 euros a month. So this is just a, like a copy of the uh, small, small table over there in case you want to look at it. There's uh, better formatted uh, versions of these tables in Teros thesis, which I'm going to provide a link for. Whoa, I still speak this through in about 30 minutes. In conclusion, we have cryptography. <clears throat> and it, it's a magic device that transforms some problems into new problems. 
such as that of key management. Key management, like if you take one thing home from here, whenever you hear crypto, think what's the key management, like how is the key management handled, where are the keys, who keeps them safe, are they still going to be available in 15 years when I still need to use the system, and so on. Key management is the thing, it's going to become more visible in the news, I would believe, because we are putting crypto in all kinds of places where it hasn't been before, and I'm hoping that everyone who is going to be touching it in any way will be now sort of aware and can go screaming and like, oh, where is your key management? And also remember, when we are deploying a system with crypto into the wild, then all of the in, like old security problems will also have an effect on that system. So that kind of stuff, like if you have awesome crypto, awesome keys, awesome um, uh, key management, none of the algorithms are broken, but you kind of neglected that you have a little bus going on here, that um, your keys are here and they're encrypting stuff and then it's actually going in clear text here on this little thing. Then you have a physical probe vulnerability. Have you considered that? And it's like, is your environment controlled enough that you can't do physical probes easily? Or is, are you accepting that risk? That kind of stuff. You're going to be impacted by software update needing, needs and so on. And things like Spectre and Meltdown. And all of this means that we basically need to always be supporting our autonomous teams in driving their security goals you structure your systems because you can only control what you can understand. I, I, I love the example of the, uh, of the key, um, key industries, 500 page documentation, where uh, someone like from the outside looking at it and sort of tr taking the effort of trying to understand it produces better documentation than the company itself that actually made the system. So when you have a system, you want to understand the system. When you're using a system, when you're using a framework, you want to understand the framework. You don't want to just sort of go poke around, oh, I, got, I got it working, ship it off. Then structured work. This is basically, uh, it's a large topic actually, but the structured work point of view, you need to address the blunt end of human error. We call it human error, but it's usually uh, there's uh, two, two sides of a human error, you have the uh, spare head where you have like the uh, one guy who gets blamed for it all. Like for example, if you have a plane flies into a wall, we usually blame the pilot because he was in the plane, in control of the plane when that happened. But for a plane to do something really bad, lots of other things need to fail first. And that's the blunt end of human, human error. So the blunt end is something that we can address and it's usually not the most fruitful solution uh, for a human, uh, human problem to um, put more pressure on the front sparehead. Because, for example, doctors, pilots, and, uh, and systems operators in like, high-stress high environments, those are guys who are basically the hands and eyes of all of us who are developing the system that they're using in there. So we need to actually make their life as easy as possible. And when shit hits the fan, we need to sort of feel part of the pain always. There's actually a very interesting, uh, they analyzed the, um, actually any, let's say any in incident that there has been, like when they get analyzed in detail, then the, the sort of the depth of organizational failure behind the human error, the, the further you look, the more sort of creepy it becomes. It's, it's usually never that one guy like, had the gall to not install a patch, all horrible of them. But yes, remember also, organizational failure. We call it human error, but it's usually an organizational failure. And structured environment, you want to know what you are protecting from, and you want to know what context you are protecting it in. Whew. I have some references. Teros thesis, it's great. It's a, uh, it's a MSNG thesis, so it's a master's thesis. I abbreviated it out of the top of my head the wrong way. Uh, and also uh, a link to an idea, uh, not-for-profit organization for conversion training of not just coders, because we really need more people in the cybersecurity. So that's a reference for that also. Uh, or you can also come to talk to me about this. And since, since I mentioned these controls, that's what I talked about. And if you're interested in the human error aspect, uh, I recommend the book Behind Human Error. That was a reasonably nice read. And also I recommend Teros Thesis, which was also looking into this. I'm, I've already solved all of my problems and it's, I still have 25 minutes. <laughs>
I hope you have some questions. Thank you. The bike is running around. Where is the person with my... I hope I didn't surprise them that I was like done too early. I don't see a microphone person. I'm going to improvise. Tell me. Okay. So, um, <laughs> yo, uh, which from which one have you had more lulls in in your career, like actual incidents from human problems with processes regarding crypto key management and handling? or with actual software errors? Hmm, so the question was, which, <laughs> which, which kind of problems have been giving me the most? I'm going to translate those into, into sort of face palms. Uh, what, what, what has given me more emotional response, human errors in, in following processes, for example, or software errors? Um, I'm going to say that humans are by far the more interesting. Even behind a software error, eventually, I'm going to look at the, sort of mentally look at the developer, like what were they thinking when they coded it this way? So in the end, all of this security is inherently a human activity. And in the end, like, whenever we're looking at these problems, software is an expression of human thought or abstraction of human thought. So all of this is in the end, some kind of human slash organizational error. So in that sense, I'm always uh, having the most emotional impact on uh, various kinds of human failure. Any other questions? If we have, we have mics, so I don't need to come to your face every time. <laughs> you talked about expiring the keys. Yes. So I'm wondering if you have this uh, remote endpoint device and uh, you need to expire the keys. Do you think that it makes sense to give very short expiry times? Because <laughs> if you lose the private key of the remote endpoint, you probably lose the remote endpoint. So uh, how would you deploy the replacement key? And also, what's the point of deploying keys to somebody else's machine? Because it's not yours anymore once you've leaked the keys. Uh, yes. Um, some use cases where you want to keep um like you give a device away to someone, but they might expect you to, for example, update the firmware still yourself and not allow, for example, their neighbor to update the firmware. So my option, if, you, if you have, I have, for example, a uh, John who wants to, wants to have a VLAN box. I guess we don't sell any VLAN boxes. But um, John wants to have a VLAN box, so I can either have a conversation with John that, hey, John, can you give me your key? So, you can sign whatever software I'm going to install into your VLAN box, or do, would you like to just have connectivity to the internet? And oftentimes, Johns want to have connectivity to the internet, so what happens is that your VLAN box needs to be able to trust software from somewhere, and preferably not from someone else than you. Maybe kind of like you might have a vendor in between who wants to also put software in there, but you don't want, to, want it to trust software from, for example, the Moscow School of Hackers, whose exercise it is to break into this. Um, so then uh, you want to be able to push the software into the node. And in that case, you will want to have some kind of keys in the box. But it's going to be very difficult. Um, to, it, like generally, we want to expire keys for some reason, because they, the keys will be all, always too short eventually. The algorithms will break. There's going to be some other, other cause. For example, a problem in validation allows like you need that you need to be able to revoke your key because you are finding out that you signed something that has a hole for example you need to be able to preferably you would be able to revoke the actual image and not the key but in any case there's various situations where you need to update uh, the keys and preferably you would have like this ability to pre predict what kind of algorithms will be sensible like a decade from now when your box your vlan box is still in the market and be able to update that but you're generally not able to do that so you need to have some kind of trust anchors there. Uh, if you have a special trust anchor just for key updates, maybe you can do it that way. Or you might, be able, you might just sort of need to be able to plan some kind of trust 
the key that I gave you while the key was still not expired, and then you need to worry about time and that kind of stuff. So PKI operations is a pain in the ass, but in general, uh, what you want to kind of think about is which one is worse that you uh, expire, the life. which one is worse that you uh, will trust an old key or that you don't have any kind of access anymore or that you trust some wrong key. And these are all like basically risk assessments that depend a lot on the way that the box is used, how long it's in the market. Like our base stations, like the, when did 2G come out? Some of these things are as old as me. And that's kind of creepy that you like, can I really design like decide on some crypto algorithm now that would be secure even 20 years from now? So this is this is kind of the problem that we're facing. So we want to be able to not necessarily expire keys like on a clock, even though that's also nice. Having a systematic uh, expiration cycle make means that you have like ex expertise um, experience in expiring the keys as well. But uh, when you need to make a revocation, that's usually always the special case. And it's the first time anyone's ever done this on this box. Do we dare to, exp like, uh, do we dare to revoke the key? Because it might mean that nothing works anymore. Have we ever tested this? And that kind of stuff. Like in that sense, also expiration cycles might be good. Because then you've actually pr practiced this. And it forces you to keep a clean house. And you know that it's always going to happen. Then you need to test for it as well. <laughs> Did this answer your question? Any other questions? What's your recommendation for generating high entropy or randomness in the keys? And are, do you have your own system, or are you trusting a third-party system to do that for you? Entropy is horrible. Yes, entropy is horrible. Like basically, entropy is like um, uh, we want to be able to generate random keys, and one of the tools that we use for generating random keys is entropy. And um, I'm going to say that I can't actually give you good advice on this. I'm thinking like, for example, if you're in a cloud context, then you can't, uh, then you don't have much anything to sort of work with. You might have a cloud HSM in the corner, a hardware security module that might like nicely offer you entropy if you can trust that the connection between you and the uh, HSM is somehow actually working. Um, I'd say that in Every case we are going to be trusting for our entropy sources, we are always trusting something outside ourselves. Uh, eventually, the thing that might separate us might be just a bus, or it might be the internet. And it, uh, I would say uh, that the internet is a bit uh, un unpleasantly easy to spoof. So you might not be getting your entropy from, from your source that you're thinking about. So it depends uh, on your use case. And I think like my... <sighs> Um, slightly depressing, but maybe a bit relieving uh, answer to this is that this problem cannot be solved in some sense. So then you just kind of wing it and hope that your giant turtle keeps on swimming while it's carrying the world on top of it. Another question here. A lot of organizations oh. have made an effort to deploy PKI infrastructures, um, a lot of the times trying to have a single universal certificate authority. Almost inevitably, in every organization I've seen that's tried this, it's failed, predominantly because as they add new systems, they add new PKI uh, infrastructures. It's very common, for example, to see Apache uh, server environments or WebSphere environments or JBoss completely separate with their own PKI. Likewise, with a lot of authentication infrastructure, Active Directory has its own, even if you're using other environments. Do you actually, do you believe that organizations have the uh, compliance and the governance to be able to do this properly um, with a centralized function? Hmm. I think like um, in herds of gorillas, <laughs> you can have law and order when you have about like a hand, large handful of them. And then if you have a bit more, like 10 or so, you're going to need a police who goes and punches the bad gorillas. And if you have bigger than that, you need to have someone who punches the police for um, if they're punching people wrong. So large organizations have the problem that uh, control doesn't scale. So in that sense, you will have a series of small organizations. Uh, what I think is going to be like the solution here as well is communication in that um, you can try to sort of say that, okay, everyone needs to have like 
there's only one universal uh, key management system and or key management people and you always talk to them whenever you're dealing with keys and then eventually if you have like a very large house then you might still have pockets of things bubbling up and then you sort of go there and you find out and then you adopt them like now we're gonna revoke your root key and then or we're gonna adopt the root key into this whatever bubble but I don't trust uh, it, like if um, I kind of I was hearing a different question at first that that would it make sense to have a single root to rule them all and for all use cases don't don't go there like it sounds cool but I don't think that a single root is the way to go at least like when, when I'm seeing lots of different use cases for PKI no no it just can't be done in a tiny organization it might work If you have a, a single key to get access to all the, uh, sorry, the question was that if there is some kind of root key to access the systems that manage the keys to access all the other systems, then isn't it still a single root key to rule them all? It's uh, like the answer to uh, the literal question is that no, it's still not the, uh, like management wise, you can still do things in a different way because, uh, for example, if you have, if you sign a software which has a hole and find out that because you have a sucky, uh, Saki key um, kind of validation system you have to revoke the key because of this then that means that you need to revoke the key here and not this key that kind of affects everything else so you can still kind of limit problems that are bubbling from the from the bottom you can still limit them and even though you have a key that allows you to sort of wipe all the keys but then this NSA key that that you can kind of get into all of your systems which have the keys and then everything is lost don't have that kind of key but uh, yeah, typically you'll want to, for example, have a single, uh, if, <laughs> if you like um, one of those strange people who don't enjoy pain, you might want to have, for example, a single HSM, hardware security uh, module brand, that is going to take care of all of your keys. If you have that, I have news for you, then there is an AES, AES key that can actually unlock all of your keys, um, or whatever key. Uh, usually... Um, AES is considered the industry gate encryption. So basically what you are going to have, you want to have enough diversity depending on what kind of your use cases you have. And then you kind of want to decide like, okay, if someone cracks into this, what kind of things can I allow them to take with them? And if you can't allow some things to go with them, then you put those in some other system and hope that not everything gets broken at the same time. And yeah, you have to have recovery plans. And it, also really, it really depends on how expensive it is for you when the keys are lost. Because it's not, really, it's not really a problem if your keys are lost. It's the human trust that you're translating into those keys that is lost on the way. And you need to evaluate the price of that. Because you won't, of, you won't have enough money to make it perfectly secure anyway. So you're going to have to kind of evaluate that, okay, the cost is about this much. I want to make it as exp expensive for the attacker as I can with my budget, for example. More. So, which would be less of a horrible problem, key expiration or revocation? <laughs> less of a horrible problem. I, I like key expiration because it's kind of inevitable and then it's ticking and revoca revocation is usually something that you can decide. I'm going to revoke this thing. And then you're going to think about how am I going to tell this uh, to all the boxes I have outside that, hey, I revoked this key. I'm going to tell it by a software update. No, my vendors don't want it. I in my, my um, box users, they don't want to update software. Their system is working. They don't want to touch it. Um, so I'm going to tell it, tell, the, tell it to them over the internet. Oh, these systems are actually internet connected. Um, I'm going to have a sneaker network and every, every device is going to be touched by this <laughs> reprogramming thing. So revocation is a problem of communication. Like the revocation doesn't happen before you've actually told the box that don't trust this key anymore. While meanwhile, there's expiration is a, um, is a um, what's it, it's, it's kind of a uh, crisis uh, handling exercise instead because your box is going to say, ah, I'm not listening to you anymore because the key you're talking to me with has expired. And I'm like, but I would still like to be able to update this product and I didn't think about in, this in, in advance. So in that sense, um, 
there's, I kind of like the expiration problems more because they sort of are more horrible. But the revocation problem is fascinating because that's also like where your security is. So it's either you're, you're either going to have problems with the confidentiality and the integrity, or you're going to have problems with the availability, or all of them at the same time in a perfect world. Any more questions? One more here. There was uh, some answer about entropy, but uh, it makes me wonder, uh, do you know any practical attacks against common entropy sources? For example, in Linux systems on desktops and laptops, you generate the keys with something like dev random or dev u random. Do you actually know a working attack against this entropy? Um, I don't actually think about it as in terms of attack, but uh, dev, you, uh, dev random is, it collects stuff from all kinds of things. When you're start starting up, for example, lots of fresh VMs, uh, and they get lots of um, internet connections, for example, that they need generate uh, keys and uh, like uh, session keys and all kinds of things for. They will use up the stuff that they have for the VM, and then you need to somehow feed in more entropy. So like, like in a virtualized environment, there isn't enough hardware interrupts and that kind of stuff going on, and you might not know where the hardware interrupts are coming from, so you might not actually be able to sort of trust that it's actually random. And when you become predictable, then your keys are predictable, and then your security kind of falls down. So in that sense, yeah. Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you very much. And it's been very, very nice talking to you.